Harry Dillard said, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. Where's my wee clicker going? Scott, do you know where my clicker is? <laughs> I'm lost about it. But unfortunately, even though how we spend our days is how we spend our lives, we spend an awful lot of those days at work. And what someone does for a living really plays a big impact on how you perceive them. You know, the first question we tend to ask someone we meet is, what's your name? It's a follow-up question, what do you do for a living? And it's always really interesting whenever uh, you're meeting somebody and you're talking with somebody, say, you know, I'm in the barbers or whatever, you know, they're cutting the wee bits that are there. Uh, and then they say, so what do you do? And say, oh, I'm a pastor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it has an impact. Now, over the course of Colossians 3, Paul is showing us how to lead full lives. Jesus himself will come and say, I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. Yet, to, to look at so many Christians, you think that life has been sucked out of them, it's been emptied out of them. It's like their faith is just all these rules of do's and don'ts. And so in Colossians, what Paul has been trying to do is deconstruct these misconceptions of extra baggage and say, look, listen, forget all that stuff. If you're alive in Christ, that life should flow into every part of your life. But here now also, not only in your church life, your character, we've looked at your home life, the, your, your marriages as godly wives, godly husbands, godly parents. But here now also in your professional life, Christianity does not fit inside a bubble. It does not work inside a bubble. So many Christians talk about being in a bubble. Christianity doesn't work like that. It should be seen in whatever we do, wherever we go. At work more so than anywhere else. People with no interest in church can see for themselves what a Christian does over the weekend. Can see what kind of jokes and sense of humour a Christian has. How a Christian will react when under pressure. How much money can motivate a Christian's decision making or morality or ethics. <clears throat> what does a Christian do when unfairly treated by the boss? Our faith is on display. Ultimately, does Jesus really make a difference? Which means that every Christian is in full-time ministry, whether we um, think about it or not. Okay, I'm in full-time ministry in this place, but you are in full-time ministry wherever you go during the week. Whether you step into work tomorrow morning, or into school, or into university, we represent God and have an opportunity to live for him in front of everyone else. We're not there to fit in. We're there to stand out. And I don't mean to stand out by being weird or being critical or being arrogant. So, let's be honest, some Christians stand out for all the wrong reasons, all right? And it's not never good. It's always awkward. It's always uncomfortable. But we should stand out by being outstanding. Listen to what Paul says here as we read through the verses. We're going to read from verse uh, 22 of chapter 3 to verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your <coughs> earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Amen. So Paul is talking as a Roman citizen to a church in the middle of the Roman Empire at the height of the empire's power. And he used his language, not of employee and employer, but of slave and master or servant. The term, doulos, the Greek, it, it's really interchangeable, okay? It's like saying, well, part-time and full-time. You still work for them. 
And Paul is talking to anyone who has a boss, but he uses the language of master and servant. Now, Drew's going to put a graphic up on the screen here that slavery is a real issue still today. More than 40 million people around the world are in modern day slavery. <coughs> That's one in four of those are children. 25 million, the biggest majority of them, are forced labour. So when we talk about the people who are building the football stadiums of the Qatar World Cup, it's that kind of thing. Last year, forced labour alone was reckoned to be worth $150 billion. In Northern Ireland, trafficking reports have gone up 47% year on year. It's a real issue. And it's one that we ought to be praying for. But back in the Roman Empire, all right, a, a smaller <laughs> scope of land, they reckon that there were 60 million slaves. Okay, so 40 million today, 60 million then. We're probably not as advanced and further on in society as what we would like to think. But in the Roman Empire, those numbers meant that every other person was a slave. 50% of the empire was probably in some sort of slavery. Now, that's a, that's a very important thing culturally for these verses in Colossians. Because of slavery, because you made the slave do everything for you, the Romans felt that work was beneath them. Uh, work, no, that's what a slave does. That, that's something that we don't degrade ourselves to do. No, I'm not a slave. People work for me. So, uh, my point is this, that whenever I start talking about slaves and then start talking to you about employees, don't be thinking that I'm making some sort of socialist Marxist commentary or something like that there, okay? It's like, oh, you, you know, let's cast off the chains of rebel for that. No, we have employees and employers. They have masters and slaves. That was just how their economy worked. Okay, so we have to just shift our, our, our thinking to, to match up. So maybe you'd expect Paul to, to say something like, well, you spirit-filled, God-filled, Christ-imitating, godly husbands, wives, children, parents, Free your slaves. Free your slaves. Liberate them. This horrible bondage of slavery has to go. Do the Christian thing. But he doesn't say that. <clears throat> he doesn't say that. In fact, he even sends a runaway slave, Onesius, back to his master Philemon. Right? The whole letter of Philemon is all about this slave going back to his master. And what's interesting is actually when you get to chapter 4 of Colossians, we'll meet Onesius before he goes back to Philemon. He's the one who delivers the letter of Colossians to the church in Colossae. My point is that Paul is not writing some random thoughts from an ivory tower and saying, oh yes, well, hypothetically, this is what I think should happen. No, he's speaking from a prison cell into a real situation because he counts as friends the people that this is going to impact. Okay, so this is something that he is thinking through deeply and profoundly. This world of slavery was the world that the church was born into. Did it challenge the institution of slavery? Not at first. Remember that the church at this point is a drastic minority, a handful, a few pockets of believers dotted around the Mediterranean coastline, Israel, Greece, Turkey, starting to pop up in Rome. Truth is, slavery cost was causing more of an issue inside the church than it was outside the church. Remember, everyone had to attend the same fellowship. So you could have a slave standing up and preaching to his master. The one who maybe before he had got saved had beaten you. Maybe had killed your wife, killed your kids, or sold your kids on to someone else. Broke up your family, broke your heart. That was Roman culture. It was normal for that to happen. And then he gets saved and then he's sitting in church in front of you. Could you imagine? Or for someone then who is a master, he then has to serve his slave <coughs> communion. So he's used to being having this man do everything for him. Now he's serving him communion. It's a... Uh, it was new. It was weird. It was going to take some time to figure out. 
And if anything that's new, there becomes a learning curve. And that's why Paul addresses slavery. Ephesians, Galatians, <coughs> Colossians, Corinthians. All address the issues of slaves and masters living together and worshipping God and bringing glory to God. As a testimony of what God can do in, in people's lives. Okay, we're going to flick it on here, Drew. Because uh, our first point here then is the right behaviour. Paul's advice to the slave then is obey your master. Don't fight back. Don't rebel. And it's interesting. He never says that. He never says let's go abolish slavery. Paul never intended, never attended a, a rally or a protest against slavery. He didn't do it. No. Don't misunderstand me. The Bible is very much against slavery. It speaks out against it. But the church has a bigger goal. <coughs> Their focus was not social reform, but salvation. It wasn't about trying to change the empire. It was about trying to rebuild the kingdom of God. So the church isn't called to save the world, but to save people from the world. We're in the business of changing people, amen? Which means that if you change enough people, eventually you'll change the society that we live in. That was how the church impacted the world. In 1 Corinthians 7 we read, Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you, when God saved you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave of Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, Remain as you were when God first called you. No, it's just because you're a Christian and don't expect everything around you to change. It changes you and who you are in that place, in that space. So uh, addressing slavery, yeah, it's a good thing. But for the church, it's not the ultimate thing. Mark 8, Jesus said, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Paul might say, what does a prophet a man if you free him from his slavery, but he's never freed from sin? Or let me paraphrase it maybe for today. What does a prophet a man if the church goes about trying to make him so comfortable and loved and accepted that he never feels the need to repent? Now, we are to live in love. We are to be a blessing in the city we live in. We are to be salt and light and warmth. How could we not be? Colossians 3 is all about how being alive in Christ changes us and who we are and how we do things. It should show, it should beam out of us. A godly Christian should be a blessing wherever they go. And I really truly believe no one cares what you know until they know that you care. But the point that Paul is making in these letters is that whatever your circumstances, wherever you are, whatever is going on around you, God can still use you for his glory. That's what Paul's trying to say. So whatever job you have, whatever role you play, whatever company you work for, God can use you there. Look it on there. Well, we still didn't get that quicker, did we? That's gone. Oh, somebody stole it. <laughs> what does it profit a man to free him from the world or not? So, how do we use work then to bring glory to God? How do we use our work then to be witnesses for him? If we're wanting to change people, then we can change the society to, to bring glory to God. How do we do that in our nine to five or in our shift work? How do we do that? Well, Paul says, work wholeheartedly. Not by way of eye services, people pleasers, but with a sincerity of heart. In other words, folks, whenever you're at work, you do your best. 
You do quality work, not just when the boss is there, not just when there's supervision or there's reports coming in or when there's assessments happening. You work so that you can be proud of what you've accomplished and when you leave you go, I did good work today. I remember, you know, remember in school whenever any teacher left the classroom for any length of time at all? You just start talking, pen down, start chatting, talking. There's always one person doing laps in the classroom and stuff being thrown. And then there's somebody who goes, she's coming, she's coming, she's coming. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden it's like, oh yes, we, we've been doing this the whole time. That's eye service. Working whenever people are looking. Slacking off when they're not. <clears throat> Whenever you're at the fence and Alan and Mark walks past, and all of a sudden the press ups there get proper technique instead of just kind of lying or you know, having a wee sleep for a minute or two. That's eye service. Paul says our work should be sincere. That word sincere comes from two Latin words sin, meaning without, and care, or ser, meaning wax. To be sincere means to be without wax. Why? Why does it mean that? Well, we've talked about this before. Imagine that back in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, you're a sculptor and you, you invest a large amount of money in a block of marble and you spend months and months and months carving out a statue that somebody's commissioned you to do, perhaps of their wife or, or something like that. Uh, and so you spend all this time and energy and resources on it and you're just putting those final touches on and you just Oh no, the nose comes flying off. You spent months. And you're not going to throw it all away and start again. So what you do is you get all the marble dust gathered together, you get some wax and you mix it together to form a paste and you glue the nose back on. And you sell the statue of the man's wife to the guy. And then later on that week he's having a party, he unveils the statue of his wife, but in the Mediterranean heat, it's melted and this beautiful statue she's kind of turned into like a uh, well a stroke victim or a, you know like a Picasso or something mm. and it's like oh that's not good so, so they were obliged to sell or, or the merchandise is either being with wax or without wax it was to be con carry with, with wax or uh, sin carry without wax was consistent throughout, it was whole. It was the same the whole way through. Paul isn't saying that we skip into work every day and pretend that every shift is the best shift ever. But simply that when we're in work, we work sincerely. We're consistent, we're authentic in how we do our work. Christians should be able to work unsupervised, no problem. Drew's going to put up Titus chapter 2 here. He, he tells employees, be submissive to your own masters in everything there to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. I love that phrase, adorning the doctrines of God. You are to make your theology beautiful by how you live it. In other words, it may not ever make it to your annual reviews or your job performance reports, but how we work should speak volumes about our faith. Don't be the person who lets the slack off as soon as you can, who cuts corners as often as you can. Take pride in doing the best work that you can do. Take pride in your workmanship. It shows the world you're different. <coughs> Is there a job that people in your work avoid? Maybe the cups pile up in the office sink and everyone kind of just looks around waiting for somebody else to clean them all. Well, maybe taking pride in your work and working authentically means not waiting for other people to do those things that you could do. And your willingness to do it will take the stigma out of it. Think about Jesus, he was the servant king. 
He washed his disciples' feet. They were all arguing about it. They were wanting to bring a servant and a slave, someone lower than them, to wash their feet for them because that was something a servant did. And Jesus got up and did it. And after he had, he had spoken to him, after he had done it, he tells them, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. That's a huge thing. What did he mean by that? He meant don't let an opportunity pass to serve people because you were too proud to seize the moment. That's what part of our family devotion was about on Monday night after Fit the Fence. I was asking the girls, okay, what does it mean to wash people's feet in school? Not literally, obviously, so what, what does it mean? What does it mean to do things for other people? To show them that we care whenever maybe they wouldn't want to do it. How can we be a blessing to others in the small things that we do? So we've got the right behavior. Next, we've got the right attitude. Paul says, work wholeheartedly, do the right thing, give your all. But then he also says, but do it spiritually. Do the right thing, but do it for the right reasons. Three times in these verses, he talks about the vertical dynamic to work. In verse 22, he says, work with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Verse 23 says, work heartily as for the Lord and not for them. And then verse 24, point blank, he says, you're serving Christ. Okay, You might work for them, but you're serving Christ. You may get a salary from one guy, but you have another master who you're serving first and foremost. Imagine how that truth can transform how you go to work tomorrow morning. It can turn the most boring job into an exciting ministry. Because whatever you're doing, you're going to do it for God. You're going to let God use that to do something big. Every job has its downsides. Every job has the bits that we don't like and the bits that aren't as much fun as others. But here's a new motivation. When we step into work, we're stepping into an opportunity to do something for God. Doesn't that change how we think about it? Over the last six days we have had, we have served Jesus by how we have worked. I think that's class. I think it's amazing. We've adorned the doctrines of God before the eyes of men. So why should you give your all to whatever job you happen to be in? Even if it's, if it's just a stepping stone to the job that you really want, or the career that you really want, and, and you're part-time, or you're trying to get through college, or you're trying to do whatever... Number one, the Lord is no man's debt, first and foremost. But number two, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 25. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Okay, and then the people he's talking to says, well, when, when did all this happen? When did we clothe you? When did we feed you? When, when, when did you do this? Verse 40 of Matthew 25, the king answers them and says, Truly, and she up on the screen, uh, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. These little things that we do in work, we are serving God. For those of you who work in care, those clients who are maybe aggressive, those clients who, are, who maybe need additional care or extra help, or those who look after children, or those who take time to, to face the public but go the extra mile and not just trying to palm them off or ignore them, or, or the handyman who will do a job and knock a couple of pounds off because it's a pensioner, or because you know that there's something better you can do for them. We're doing it for them because when we do it to the least, we're doing it to him. changes how we think about our job, doesn't it? That, that, that changes the conversations that we have when we go into the office tomorrow. Because it's living for God in everything we do. It's serving Him. Remember who Paul's writing to. He's not talking to doctors and surgeons and, you know, kind of big world-changing people. He's talking to church and he's talking to slaves. They had menial jobs. They got no thanks. They got no choice of what they were going to do. And Paul sets in this challenge and he says, don't do it for them. Do it for God. Do it for God. I'm going to put a picture up here of a couple of guys on a build site. 
Imagine you, you walk up to, to him and three guys are standing there and you say, so, so what is it you're doing? The first guy turns around and goes, oh, I'm digging. What does it look like I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Good conversation. All right, okay. Maybe someone else will turn around and say, well, just trying to pay my bills. And then you say, oh, work for you. <laughs> right, and, and that tends to be how the conversation goes. But what if the third one turned it around and says, I'm building someone's home. I'm building a place where treasured memories will be made. And you think, boy, there's a different attitude. There, there's a different attitude in how they think about things because perspective is huge when we live our lives. It comes to, into play so much when, whenever we're working. And the thing is, it seems that the church, the Christians, listen to Paul in this because we know for a fact, historically, that at this time, Christian slaves were worth more than non-Christian slaves. It was a selling point. It raised their market value. Why? Because they were known to be good workers. They, they put in quality work. Being a Christian was a desirable quality to have in your workforce. But here's the thing, it didn't impact on the masters. Why? Because whenever you invest more money into your workforce and you know that, that, that you're getting a quality worker, you're going to look after them more. You're going to take care of them more. And so by being Christians, they were changing the work environment around them. They had a sense of work that was being connected to their faith and to their testimony. And so they gave their best all the time, even when they were unsupervised. They could be trusted to do the work well. First Thessalonians 4 says, Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. Work well. People will see it. They may not agree with your values, but they will respect the way you live. Can I point you to one of my, uh, perhaps, uh, one of my most favorite underrated Bible characters? Exodus 31. We meet Belzal Il. Belzal Il. God is speaking to Moses and he says, verse 3, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver and bronze, and cutting stones in the setting and carving wood, to work on every craft. In other words, what God is telling Moses is, I have called this guy to be amazing in his field of work. I have anointed him, I have filled him with my spirit for design. Isn't that class? Isn't that right? And the chaplains, a few other guys mentioned just like it, called by God to be a good worker, to excel in their field, spirit filled for excellence. Right. Okay, we're going to move on here, yes. Matthew 5 says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in hell. So, number one, we've got the right behavior, work wholeheartedly. We've got the right attitude, work spiritually. Let's just finish very quickly on the right motive. Work confidently. Verse 24, knowing, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. In the ancient world, slaves didn't get an inheritance of the reward. They didn't get a cut of the profits. They didn't get a thank you. But Paul reminds the, the slaves in Colossae that we know our master in heaven doesn't work like that. He works differently. He, you know that God has a reward for you working well and bringing glory to him. So I don't know who needs this this morning. I don't know who really needs to hear this right now. But if your boss ignores you, undervalues you, overworks you, overlooks you and underpays you, or maybe just takes advantage of your work ethic because he knows that you're a Christian and it's like, hey, what would Jesus do? Right? You know that? You don't say, oh, so you're bribing me or, you know, blackmailing me into doing it. I think the Bible here acknowledges how annoying that can be and how difficult it can be to find the balance of, of, of wanting to serve and be generous and kind and open and saying yes and also not take, being taken advantage of. It can be frustrating, it can be difficult, it can be discouraging. 
but your heavenly master sees it and will not leave you without reward. So don't be discouraged. Don't let the frustration rob you of your witness that comes from hard work, from being consistent, knowing that even when other people can't see how hard you're working and the work that you're putting in and the time and energy that you're doing and busting a gut for a boss that won't even notice or worse, might just take credit for your work. Don't let who they are drag you away from who God has called you to be. God knows you did the work. God knows you've been faithful, and he knows you did it for him. Romans 2, 6. He will render to each person according to his deeds. Revelation 22. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. That takes us to verse 1 of chapter 4. And he speaks to the employers, and he says basically the same thing. The same applies to you. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master in heaven. Philip's translation says, not forgetting that you have a heavenly employer. The Christian faith is not about what happens on the outside, but what happens on the inside. Christ has given us a new motivation, not a new organization. So a man who becomes a Christian could still own a slave, could still be an employer like Philemon. But how he treats them should fly in the face of what we think about slavery. Because that man was a brother in Christ. In the same way God has bought us for a price to redeem us and give us a new life that we never thought we could have, so a new employer should be open and kind and generous to the, his, his staff as much as he can be. Your staff are not disposable. They're not just numbers on a spreadsheet. They are people with souls. So think about how you treat them. Think about their families. Think about how you treat them. And you hear all kinds of stories about some of the big companies today. There was a story this week, Amazon have a 3% turnover of their staff weekly. That they are worried that they'll run out of people to employ in their hubs. By 2025, they're going to run out of people to employ. People abuse apprenticeship programs. Delivery companies make, make their drivers subcontractors so they don't have to give them overtime or benefits and pension. These companies have huge turnover of profit but huge turnover of people because no one wants to work for them for very long. That should not be the case in your department. I'm sure you can remember having a horrible boss when you were starting off and you know the stories of what it was like and how they were treated you. Imagine if then they turned around and invited you to church. How would that go down? How would that be received? Christian employers should be different. You're still under God's authority, so treat people right. Be concerned for their families. Make sure they get their benefits. We've seen already uh, over the last couple of weeks how a husband should love his wife, how a father should teach his children. A leader leads by serving. African proverb says, the chief is the servant of all. It's based off Matthew 20, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Any authority that you may have has been given to you by the grace and the providence of God. There's great responsibility then to serve well. That's chapter 3. The lesson Paul wants our faith to make a real difference. It can't just be about, well, here's my experience and here's what I know and here's what I do. Look how cool I am. Look how spiritual I am. Look at all the boxes I tick. It has to make a real impact in real life. And our lives then can be filled. Remember John 10. I have come that your life might be filled. Filled to the fullest. Fullness in our marriages. Fullness in our homes. Fullness in the workplace. Does that mean it'll be easy? No. If anything, it can be harder to swim against the flow. But don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. 
because we know that we long to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. The biggest call that we have is to do more than pull people out of slavery, but is to see people saved from sin. And how we perform at work can play a big part in that. Let's pray. And then we'll sing this sermon again. Father in heaven, we thank you for the, the challenge of your word. Lord, so often that we like to pigeonhole things. And now we've got church on Sunday, we've got work Monday to Friday, we've got our hobbies on Saturday, and everything kind of breaks down into nice little bits, and we don't really like it whenever things kind of start to crossing over and intermingle. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to see our work as an opportunity to serve you. Our work is an opportunity to, to make a difference for you. Lord, for those whose workplace is maybe particularly difficult, whether it's because of the hours that they're expected to do or the type of boss that they have or the people who they're working with, and it's difficult for, for however many different reasons, Lord, I, I pray that they will know strength, they will know help this week. Lord, that not, not that they necessarily have a skip in their step, but Lord, that there will be a profound satisfaction in what they're doing because they're doing it for you. And you're with them in it. That each and every one of us this week would be marked by excellence. Lord, that your people would be marked by excellence. And we pray this in your name. Amen.